You've had a haircut since Wild Goose? I gave myself the haircut. <laughs> Hi, this is Frank Schaefer, and you are watching In Conversation with Frank Schaefer, which is a podcast and also live on Facebook, on YouTube. You can share this with friends. You can like whatever page it's on, become a regular viewer or listener to this podcast. Today, I am with a very old friend of mine, Gareth Higgins, who is someone that I've done a lot of things with. This is the founder of the Wild Goose Festival, uh, someone who has brought me to speak in various things. But Today, um, Gareth is here as an author of How Not to Be Afraid and founder of The Porch Magazine and The Porch Online Courses, which brings me to why we're here today. Gareth and I are doing a Porch Online course about my new book, Fall in Love, Have Children, Stay Put, Save the Planet, Be Happy, which will be published November 2nd. And I'm asking anybody who is a friend of mine or even halfway likes me or doesn't actually actively dislike me, to please pre-buy it on Amazon and drive the numbers a little bit. That's a wide nut. So Gareth and I are going to talk about the course that his magazine, Porch, offers on my book that we are going to be conducting together uh, with folks who sign up. And so I'm going to hand this off to Gareth now to kind of guide us through this so that we can discuss, even though you're watching In Conversation Live with Frank Schaefer, it is my show, but Gareth is an old friend and he's gonna guide us through it so we can talk about the porch course and get you signed up to take this course with us. So Gareth, tell us about the course a little bit and then fire away. Sure, well, I think the first important thing for me to say is I definitely do not actively dislike you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so have you pre-ordered the book? I don't know if you have <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, and um like a lot of people doing zoom zoom calls over the last 18 months or so i'm 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 uh, nomadic at the moment and so i'm in a friend's office and the door behind me is at a slant that i can't close and right. that seems appropriate because i think everything you do is at a slant and everything that I, a lot of the things that I do are at a slant. And all I mean by that is we're looking at a different angle that uh, helps us see something we haven't seen before. Yeah. You know, the old cliche is the definition of a uh, definition of insanity is to keep doing the same thing over and over yeah. and expect a different result. What we do at the porch is to look at the way we tell stories in our culture, which are often stories of separation of scapegoating, we look at the way we have defined this thing we call the news. Yeah. And really the news is, 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 I've heard someone recently refer to it as a randomly selected gathering of the worst things that happened in the last 24 hours. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it doesn't give us a rounded understanding of reality. And that's headline news that I'm talking about. It's not yeah. uh, the kind of journalism that has integrity. I, I, you did a porch course a little while ago on movies, didn't you? Yeah, I've done a couple, um, one one with Kathleen Norris on what we called It's a Beautiful Day, A Whole yeah. Life in Five Movies. And the idea was to take uh, a movie about birth, a movie about childhood, a movie about uh, youth, middle age, yeah. elderhood, and then death to help yeah. us use movies as, as uh, I guess, icons to contemplate on the point of our courses is not just to give you information but to share practices that help us live better mm. when i say live better i don't mean in terms of um simplistic prosperity be all be all you can be or get all you can have build your own rocket exit build your own rocket <laughs> <laughs> um, it's about going deeper within mm. and finding more of the authentic uh, part of you, the part of you that yeah. calls to you, um, especially the, the part that maybe gets depressed or scared because often depression and fear are just ways of our souls telling yeah. us something needs to change and also connect you with other like-minded people on a similar mm. journey. Cause you know, someone was asking me the other day, how could I summarize my book? how not to be afraid and of course you know as an author this this happens to you a lot people ask you hey summarize your book for me and yeah. you say buy the book <laughs> well for one thing you can tell them that the book is liberally quoted in my new book well 
<laughs> which, are you a liberal? Which, are you a liberal? No, liberally <laughs> quoted in the sense of generous. I mean, you know, come on, Gareth. I know you have the vocabulary to handle both <laughs> meanings of the word. Hey, uh, let me just note one thing. The porch course, uh, if people are interested, they just go to porchcourses.com. The, the porchcourses.com. Yeah, the porchcourses.com. Porch porch and of course, wow. we're going to put all that with this so that you can look at it. All the links will be there. But I'm just going to say it again. The porchcourses.com are everything Gareth's talking about. And of course, right now we are promoting the one that we're doing on yeah. uh, my new book that's coming out. So anyway, yeah, so, where did you want to take this discussion? Well, so all I'd say is like the, you know, the little summary of my book, I think is a good segue into talking yeah. about what you and I are, are going to do in this course, because how I do summarize how not to be afraid is mm. uh, learn to breathe more slowly and connect with a small group, six, eight, 10, 12 people who are all committed to the journey right. of emotional and spiritual maturity mm. and share your needs and your gifts. That's it. There's lots yeah. of other, then then how that manifests. There's infinite ways. Yes, and I think your book uh, actually names five specific ways yeah. that breathing more slowly, and I mean that both literally and figuratively. Mm. I just mean slowing down the yes. pace of your life. And you've named these five ways that can also be uh, understood as literal and figurative. Yes, fall they're both. Yeah, fall in love, have children stay put, save the planet, and be happy. And we're going to do a course over five weeks, starting on the 26th of September. And if you're listening to this well after that, it'll still be available online. The recordings will be there too, uh, where for each of those five weeks, one session a week on a Sunday evening, where you mm -hmm. can catch up later on, uh, we're going to have a conversation about each of those topics. And then you're going to have guests who you're in conversation with. Yes. And you'll teach uh, the participants a practice hmm. that helps activate this thing either fall in love have children stay put save the planet be happy so I want to ask you Frank where did the where did the idea for the book come from hmm. and what do you want people to experience from learning about it well first of all let me just say that you were very helpful to me um, when I was getting toward the end of the final draft of this book, I wrote to you and I know you had been living in an intentional community. And I said to you, Gareth, send me some information on this intentional community you lived in. Um, I need some specifics because you had been helpful in conversations about the book after you looked at the draft of it. Um, that fits in with what you're saying because it was sort of a how-to part of the book that goes outside of the literal interpretation of the fall in love, have children, stay put, save the planet, be happy. So in no particular order of importance, one of the things that I want to do in this porch course um, is explore with you and the people who sign up in conversation with me and with you and with my guests, all the ways these concepts apply. Mm -hmm. For instance, be happy. I was so struck by what you gave me to put in the book about this intentional community where whether you needed to borrow an onion because you were making a, mm -hmm. a pasta and you didn't have it, or you needed a trip to the doctor or a health issue, whether you were 90 or a toddler, you could knock on your neighbor's door or go online and get help. Mm -hmm. So one of the things the book offers besides laying out these theoretical ideas about what actually leads to our happiness, which is connection with people rather than material possessions and career first. There's also very practical things, which is, whether it's a legislative agenda or the sort of thing you contributed to the book that I quote from you in both from what you had written in your book, um, How Not to Be Afraid, um, and what you actually contributed exclusively to my book in the sense that you gave me some information on this intentional community. So I just want to say to begin with that the book fits well with this porchcourses.com idea because it too is divided into the general topic of exploring almost the spiritual side to happiness, but also the scientific side. Um, because we are really love addicts. That's how we evolve to be, to make connections. Otherwise, none of our lives mean anything. But then I do get into specifics and practicalities. And I think the porch course can be divided, not 
divided formally, but it will cover those things. Mm -hmm. So that what hopefully we are offering is a discussion of the concepts to give meaning to our lives in these areas, whether it's love or family or connection with others, whether we have children or don't have children um, in a general sense, but also the specifics. So that said, now let me get back to the question you were about to ask me, which was. Um, what do you want people to experience through the course? You know, I, here's what I want people to experience and this covers everybody. I want to be the, um, the cavalry charge over the hill while you feel besieged, help is mm. on the way. Mm. In other words, if you are a person who has decided not to have children and mm. you are non-binary and you are of a different race than me, I want this book to mean as much to you as it does to people who take a literal interpretation from the title and mm -hmm. have a family and are trying to figure out how to spend more time with their children and have a career. Mm -hmm. What I'm trying, what I want everybody to take away from this book is that when you change your personal definition of success to something that has spiritual content rooted in relationships, everything in your life shifts to the better because you evolved actually to be that person. Mm -hmm. So that um, what I hope everybody takes away from the book, no matter who they are or where they come from or what age they are, is to one, be encouraged to put the human relationships, connection and community in your life first, no matter what your situation. There is no priority that trumps that. Secondly, if you have not done this, encourage you to start doing this. If you have lived that way, be encouraged that you were not alone. Mm -hmm. And that um, here, you know, in solidarity, Gareth Higgins, Frank Schaefer, their friends, their connections are here to tell you that even if you feel you're swimming against a strong cultural current that goes in the other direction towards materialism, that goes towards a sort of a false idea of the good life, corporate values, shareholder profits. Here we are saying, no, no, that instinct you have to live differently is correct and you are not alone. Mm -hmm. So I know that's more than a thumbnail sketch, but it, it pretty much comes back down to this idea of either encouraging people to make those connections, encourage them if they have done that and paid a price for it, and looking at all of our lives and saying, how do we recenter those on the connections with the people we love away from this materialistic consumer culture that is literally destroying our planet, speaking of saving the planet. Mm -hmm. and, and why is it that we're going to wind up much happier doing this than we perhaps have been? Um, and, that, and that's not a short answer, but that's kind of where it's at, I think, for me. So on let, let's. Let's take the, the title of the book one, one segment at a time mm. and share with each other what we might mean by that. What do you, what do you mean by fall in love? You, you, couldn't, you don't simply mean Humphrey Bogart and Ingrid Bergman right. you know, or Jake Gyllenhaal and Heath Ledger uh, or uh, uh, Seeley and Suge in yeah. The Color Purple. Well, I mean all that stuff too. Uh -huh. But, so, you know, first of all, I mean it biographically. Let me just give you some examples from mm -hmm. my own life. And I used a lot of stories in the book. Let me talk about some ways I've fallen in love. Mm -hmm. And I'm not being facetious and stupid here. Sure. Um, you reached out to me when I had left the evangelical world and brought me to the new Wild Goose Festival and said, I'm going to include you again in a spiritual festival, even though you've basically been kicked out of the evangelical movement. In that moment, you were acting like my mother in the best sense of the word of caregiving. So the first thing I want to say is that I have experienced Gareth Higgins' love as a caregiver, as if you were my parent for a moment. Now, I'm not your child. Mm -hmm. And if I had never had kids and you had never known me in any other context, I have experienced your caregiving. So that's one kind of falling in love. Mm -hmm. I you acted as my caregiver in a moment of need. And therefore I reciprocated by loving you for all these years that we've been friends. Mm. That's not what you think of when you think of the romantic notion of falling in love, but it's, that's real. That's a real connection. It's a nurturing connection. So the first thing to say is that when I say fall in love, it may or may not have a sexual component. 
in my own life, I fell in love with a girl when I was 17 and, and Jeannie got pregnant and we've been together 51 years as partners. And that's a whole other story I go into a little bit in the book. But um, I've also fallen in love with my grandchildren and I have reorganized my life to do childcare for them. Not because they're related to me. And as I talk about in the book, there's all sorts of scientific studies now that say, for instance, that gay male adoptive parents have exactly the same nurturing um, brain reads when they do scans and also the hormonal levels in, in, their, in, their, in their bodies as breastfeeding mothers who are mm -hmm. biologically attached to children. Mm -hmm. So let, let's say they weren't related to me, but they were a neighbor's kids in need. Mm -hmm. By this point, I would have fallen in love with caring for them as if they were my own. Mm -hmm. So that's a different kind of love. So basically when I talk about fall in love, I am talking about that in light, that moment, that glittering moment when there is a romantic attachment. I'm also talking about that glittering moment when we receive love from someone else, whether we're related to them or not. And they suddenly come to our rescue and bear, mm -hmm. and bear our burdens with us. Mm -hmm. We fall in love with them at that moment. But I'm also mm -hmm. talking about the idea of falling in love with a different kind of living, which puts people ahead of things, which puts career and, and defining ourselves by our jobs, our titles, our, our academic degrees, a big long distance second to the connection we make with human beings, realizing that our true happiness lies in that direction. So to me, fall in love is a, is, is a term that covers the most obvious sense of the word that you see in the movies, all the way down to the fact that, and I'm not being sentimental here, I have a neighbor who just cut in half a propane tank for me because I'm trying to make an outdoor pizza oven that I've always wanted to have. And yes. by the way, he flew Trump flags on his lawn the whole time during the campaign. Mm. Mm. He and I have no political connection at all. And he wants to teach my granddaughter how to weld because she asked mm. him to. And he's a grumpy, difficult guy. I actually love this man. And I have fallen in love with a very weird thing. Here's a guy I disagree with totally on everything. And yet we have a tremendous point of connection because he's very fond of my grandchildren, teaches them things and makes me stuff when I need it. Yeah. And I, I love him for that. Yeah. And that so, is. yeah, that's our long. And, and he loves, I mean, clearly he loves you. Yeah, he does. And, 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 and the fact that he flies all the wrong stuff on his lawn from my point of view <laughs> and that I put a sign up for candidates he'd never vote for, uh -huh. and that I drive by his house and look at his lawn and figure what, whoever he's, uh, you know, for local politics, if, if, he's, if he's voting for this guy, I don't even have to figure out who, who to vote for because it's got to be the other guy. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, if I need something and I'm mixing up a whole batch of concrete and I want to go get his advice on something, he'll tell me. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and so that's a kind of love too. Yeah, yeah. Um, so have children might be the the more provocative part of yeah. the title because clearly that has a literal meaning right and um, some people have chosen to have children some people have had children through yeah. uh, with, with, without choosing it and right. some of us uh, have chosen not to and some of us can't so exactly. what does have children mean in the context of this book. well i'm very I, clear. hold on a minute i just did something that, that I, I stepped ahead i want to tell you what i mean by fall in love you're supposed to ask me that. oh yeah I yeah this, this is supposed to be a conversation but you understand that i'm an author with a new book to pitch <laughs> so unless you're careful all you're going to get is a series of monologues <laughs> so you gotta break in and say wait i want to talk now so wait, i want to talk you should now ask i'm me gonna come back and do what i was supposed to do gareth <laughs> what do you mean by fall in love? Well, funny, funny you should say that. So I, all I'd add is I love this, the idea of fall, fall. Mm -hmm. You know, I remember in French class, tombe en amour. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and tombe has the kind of, uh, um, I don't remember a lot of French, but it, it has the kind of uh, echo of tumbling. You yeah. Know? You see sort of tumbling down a hill in you know on a and that's it's a soft hill and at the bottom is this yeah. warm warm lake that you're falling into something yeah. and of course yes it happens romantically uh, but between uh, human beings uh but you know i my 
my friend John O'Donoghue, there were times when when I might be like there was a time I was at a retreat with him or there was a time he was staying as a guest in our house and he would come down in the morning and walk into the room and go, I love my life. I yeah. love yeah. my life. Now, that didn't mean that he liked everything about it or that he had no troubles. It was that he was he was consciously claiming mm -hmm. the part of his life that he could love and that yeah. he would fall more in love into. And I have certainly fallen in love with films mm. that are life-giving. Mm. I have fallen in love with walks. Mm. Uh, Brian and I, my, my husband, we walk when, when we're in Belfast, we walk the same coastal path pretty much every day. Mm. Um, and it, and it, it actually, you know, people sometimes say, well, you know, what's so interesting about the same walk every day? Well, I would refer you to one of the films that I love the most. And it's a film that I feel loves me. It's a film that humanizes me, that doesn't talk down to me as an audience member. And that's a movie called Smoke, where Harvey Keitel plays a cigar store yes. owner. Yes. He takes the same photograph every morning from yeah. the same street corner every day. Yeah. And he brings over William Hurt, the writer, to look at these pho his photograph albums. And at one level, the photographs aren't that much to look at. Mm. And as William Hurt's looking through them, he goes, they're all the same. They're all the same. Yeah. And Harvey Keitel's character says, you're looking at them too fast. <laughs> yeah. So falling, it, it's the experience of falling. It yeah. can be scary. It can be so exhilarating. And when when the thing you love or the person you love loves you back, mm. oh my, there's nothing like nothing that. better. By the I way, was, good movie. I, I was, pardon me. I said that that's a good. It's a great film. I. It's one of yeah. my favorites. Yeah, and and I, sometimes, I love smoke. sometimes it's, it just takes you to slow down enough to look at a person in the eye mm. and have a smile or a tear or you know you and your neighbor like you've discovered something to do together mm. and. I mean, that's the future of the human race. That, like, yeah. if there's to be a future of the human race, I don't even like saying that because I think it mm. can it can create a sense of collapse and apocalypse, which I and in the you know the the populist sense of the word apocalypse, yeah, which means catastrophe, is not the same as the literal meaning, which is unveiling or revelation. Yeah. I do think we're living in a time of revelation, but I think we've always been living in times of revelation, yeah. um, and I don't think that some kind of cataclysmic catastrophe is necessarily coming it might be we can't predict it all we have is today and yeah. what we have to do today is to slow down a little bit and look at each other mm. long enough to figure out well we may we may despise each other's politics but i need a pizza oven and you know how to convert a, a propane <laughs> gas tank you know i hope the gas had been removed from it yes before we cut it. yes exactly so, we're, so we're talk about half children talk about, about okay so i first of all i really like that fall in love idea because it's happened to me so many times with um you know movies plays people uh outside of the romantic context so that's great i love that you brought something artistic into it in terms of falling in love passionately with a, a movie or a piece of music another kind of falling in love and again, it makes our big point that we're trying to make together. And that is this kind of love that you tumble into serendipitously is so far away from the calculated, you know, start a high tech company in your garage, become a billionaire, build a rocket, plan your life out to have power over others, define yourself by career. Um, the opposite of that is falling in love because you, you fall into something. Somebody takes you to a movie. You love the movie. You love them, whatever it might be. I really like how you did that. Okay, so you want me to talk about have children. What do I mean by that? Well, first of all, I mean have children, <laughs> physical babies, grandchildren, the continuity of the human race, and all the love that goes with parenting and mothering and fathering and, and, and whomever that may be, single mom, whomever. So uh, that's an obvious thing. And I hope my book is encouraging to people who have kids and are struggling to figure out how what they can do about the corporate world and our political world that mm -hmm. has done everything except have fam help families. Mm -hmm. It doesn't provide childcare. Mm -hmm. School systems are rotten. You know, men that take paternity leave come back to their job and feel that their career has suffered. Mm -hmm. My women friends, including my daughter, who's a CEO of a company in New York, lie about where they are during the daytime because they feel their careers will suffer if they say they're doing a school pickup where they've taken a child to a doctor, where they just need some time with their daughter. So they say they're at the office or they're in a car on the way to a meeting. Um, you know, I've done that myself. 
you know, I'm playing with Nora, the phone rings, what are you doing? Oh, I'm, uh, you know, I'm in a meeting, I can't do this now. I don't, right. because we have this anti-family bias in our culture, which is a kind of a fake family value thing. Actually, what we value is business and money. So the first obvious thing about having kids, I am, I am encouraging people and saying, fight for your rights in that area. And actually, I draw an analogy with the way in the 70s and 80s, the gay community came out and said, we have a right to love. Mm -hmm. We have a right to marry. Mm -hmm. It's so weird. We've gone so far in the corporate direction mm. that actually conventional, you know, people who think they are in a culture which accepts them actually don't because families have to almost be in a closet and pretend they love their jobs and their businesses and their educations and their careers more than falling in love and having children. And it's time to break out of that and say, we are going to have our own uh, demands, very similar to the, to the gay community's first actions in the 70s and 80s, where they said, hey, I'm walking here, you know, to quote Razzo Rizzo from another good movie, Midnight Cowboy, I'm walking here, pay attention, I have a right to fall in love with anybody I want. Mm. So it's weird because I'm calling on what you call conventional relationships to assert themselves in a similar manner. Okay, secondly, um, I'm talking about having children in the sense of being a caregiver. So in the book, I talk about my caregiving to my grandchildren and I refer to myself as mothering. And I know that's a loaded term now because it sounds like some sort of gender or sexual orientation or uh, term to do with how we identify, not at all. I'm talking about the action of caregiving. If I'm standing in a supermarket and a woman in front of me can't pay for her groceries and I pay the bill, it's an example I use in the book. At that moment, I am mothering her. Now, whether you think that term is awkward or not, that's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about caregiving on an intense level where you're, you don't weigh it up. Shall I help? Shall I not help? You, you care give those around you in the same way as driven by instinctual survival traits, people mother their own children. And I'm calling for that kind of intentional involvement with people. So when I say have children, I mean, look at your relationship with everyone around you as an opportunity to give or receive love. See them as members of your own family, care, give them and expect to be care give, given to you. So it is really, again, getting back to that basic idea the book develops, and that is, are you your job or are you a caregiver? Mm -hmm. Are you your career or are you going to be mothering those around you? Mm -hmm. And I don't want to make this too personal again, but here, you know, I am mothering you when I put you on my podcast and say you're the author of How Not to Be Afraid because I want to help you yeah. promote that book. Yeah. You are mothering me by lending me time now, but also for the porch course, porchcourses.com. That is an act of, of Gareth Higgins and his organization, mothering Frank Schaefer and his desire to be an author who's spent five years on a book and would like someone to read it. Mm -hmm. Everyone who, and, and this is not a, I know it's going to sound like a commercial, but those people at Wild Goose that I asked to pre-order my book when I spoke down at the festival did. And the next day I saw the Amazon numbers reflect that they were reaching out to me in a caregiving capacity mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and helping me when I asked for help. Mm -hmm. All right. So you see someone sitting in an emergency room, you're stuck there with a the sprained ankle. They're looking really sad. Take those earbuds out, turn off your cell phone and go over and ask them how they are. Talk to them. If they need a ride home, give them one. If they're stuck, find a way to help them. That is, you know, not charity. That's mothering. That is becoming the caregiver in their life. So when I talk about have children, I mean the physical children, I mean the physical grandchildren, I mean the grandparenting, but I mean taking that emotion, whether you have children, decided not to have children, can't have children, you are still a caregiver. As much as the physical mother who bore you, we are caregivers. And I'll go one step further. I'm an optimist about the fate of the human race for one reason. And this is borne out completely scientifically in terms of our hunter-gatherer period and how we evolved. Were we not instinctually caregivers, and remember the thesis of my book is if you wanna be happy, get in tune with how we evolved to be, which is the survival of the friendliest, you and I would not be sitting here 
because somewhere back in your history, there was a baby lying by a ditch 10,000 years ago, 50,000 years ago, and a stranger came by, picked that child up and saved it. That was your ancestor. Mm -hmm. And unless, unless there was caregiving and sharing, and unless when we were hunter gathering, the weak were shared with by the strong, if it was really the survival of the fittest and not the survival of the friendliest, guess what? There would be no human race now. We're only here at all with all the bad things, all the wars, all the killing and all the rest of it. Nevertheless, the overarching story is one of caregiving. Mm -hmm. And we need to get ourselves back in tune with that and away from corporate values of shareholder profits and back to the caregiving of those around us. So in a sense, um, when I say have children, the really important message goes beyond our own physical families uh, to a mentality which really changes our relationship with the world around us. And by the way, as a parent and grandparent is the very best thing we can do for those children as well, because it introduces them into a way of living. So it's not like there's one here, here's a, somebody without kids and here's somebody with children. We are all exactly in the same position. And the choice is, are we gonna be caregivers or not? And that's what Have Ch Children is about. And now, Gareth, how do you see it? Well, all of that, and, uh, and, I, and I think really what's helpful to me as someone who's not a literal parent yeah um and you know someone who's in a in a, in a same-sex relationship and until and until recently it was almost impossible for two men partnered with each other to be able to adopt the right. system was stacked against us and the culture was stacked against us and yeah. you know two women together uh same thing um and i also am you know conscious of uh, fr uh, friends who don't have children and it hasn't been a choice and it's yeah. been it's been something they grieve it's been something that's a yes. source of pain for them and what helped me uh to understand the the, the whole sort of have children thing what it could <clears throat> mean um and how we could overcome this false dichotomy in our society that says there are parents who are productive members of society right. and people who are not parents who are kind of lazy and selfish i mean this is just bullshit yeah it's just i mean it's worse than bullshit yeah. it's dehumanizing yeah um uh, bigoted yeah. stuff um there are people who don't have kids that would love nothing more than to be a parent and their parents some parents are not that good at being parents mm. and I, we want to help all of us, I love the idea of progeny. I think that's the word. Right. You're the intellectual yeah, in this yes. conversation. Progeny is the word. And, progeny and, is a good word. And, and procreativity, mm -hmm. which is about what you, by yourself and with others, can co-create, can yeah. bring into the world, whatever it might be. I'm thinking with two days ago being the 20th anniversary of 9-11, mm -hmm. my friend Lyndon Harris, who is a parent, uh, mm -hmm. but... Uh, one of the things that he has procreated in the world is mm. these things called gardens of forgiveness, where he goes to places where there have been intense civil conflict and violence. Mm. And he works with local communities and they build gardens that memorialize those who have suffered and invite yeah. reconciliation. What a beautiful idea. It's one of the many parts of what his yeah. legacy uh, will be. Uh, your, your, your legacy includes your literal parenting, but it also includes your books and it includes the way you've been vulnerable yep. and transparent about your. And by the way, it includes having raised a son who's now 50, my oldest son, mm -hmm. who uh, has not had children, will not have children, has taught for 30 years. And when I meet parents of students he's helped, this sounds Oprah esque, but they have tears in their eyes when right. they say, Are you Francis's father? The reason my daughter got into medical school is yep. because he cooked her lunch every weekend and gave her extra math tutoring yep. and helped her become a physics major. And then she went into medicine. Yep. He's so in, her in parent sense, as much as her mother is. That's right. In a sense, he's had dozens of children. And yeah, he's had dozens of children. And that's, of course, more specific because he's a teacher. Sure. But there's plenty of people in neighborhoods and there's plenty of people in communities and in churches and in colleges and so forth. I mean, some of the most intense parenting I know um, is done by people who are not physical parents. So, and I make a big point of this in the book, by the way, right from the forward all the way through. It's not like some token thing. I just want to tell people this. 
I don't do, you know, there's ways of saying a thing in a book, as you know, because you're an author, where this is my gut and this is what I really mean. And then you sort of throw in a token thing, like some of those kind of people are my best friends bullshit. What, you know, this is not a token thing. It's a, it's a, it's a theme woven through the book throughout that I feel passionately strong about because I have people in my own family who have chosen not to have children as well as people who have and people beyond that, like you. So who, who my friend and, and I see the parenting strength of so many people who are not physically parents in parenting the entire community they're in or the children or the teachers. So it's yeah. a point I make anyway. I don't yeah, want to. So I, I think that what, you know, whatever, wherever you're located in the, whether or not you have literal children, right. You are invited to procreate something into the world. And that could even include, you know, you're a, you're, you're a person who meditates a lot. Yeah, exactly. You're bringing, you're bringing something into the world, a person who prays a lot, a person yeah. who, who, who shares their space with others. Yeah, a person who makes makes different use of the time available to you because yeah. you don't have literal children. All kinds of yeah. stuff. People get what we mean. Absolutely. The invitation here in this course is, whoever you are, whatever, yeah, um, whether you have literal children, you plan to, or you don't have literal children, whether it's a source of pain, yeah, or then a conscious choice with which you're satisfied. Yeah, there's an invitation to create something in the world. Yeah. What does stay put mean? Well, and how does it apply to people like me whose vocation is to be on the road some of the time to, to share with people? Well, you know, obviously it doesn't apply to, to that. And it doesn't apply to airline pilots or sailors or fishermen. You know, I'm not talking about standing physically still. Again, it's to do with the relationship to what we think our idea of success is. You know, as I was researching this book, I found out some stunning stuff about the number of time people, at least in North America, the United States, move for their jobs. And I'm not talking about a migrant person who is moving, picking fruit and then berries and something else. I'm not talking about bare necessities moving, the single mom who has to move because she needs a job. Yes. I'm talking about people who consistently move away from family and friends, move away from community, and always for the same reason. They're seeking higher pay, higher status, defining themselves by their job. And then they wake up one morning and they're really lonely. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, or they're, or, or they're in a relationship and they have no support structure. Well, you know, when grandmother's living in Orlando, Florida, you know, and you're in Phoenix, Arizona, and this is the, by the way, the average number of times an American moves for jobs is 11 times and I'm not talking around a community, you have essentially, if you revisit the evolutionary village with me in my book, you will find that, duh, we all like, we all need stability and we need continuity and we need community. You know, going back to having children, it really does take a village. And realizing that you are a child, even if you're 80 years old and you keep moving for jobs, takes you away from the rooted community sense where you can give love and receive love from other people. These are no brainers, but our culture has become really stupid about stuff like this. Mm -hmm. And that is, we think that as long as it's good for our career, you know, um, we're passionately in love, but we don't marry the guy or the girl or pair bond or go off with them because we're so invested in our PhD program and we let the relationship slip. And 10 years later, we say, what have we done? I was in love, I had somebody, but I put this first because it gave me more status. It gave me more job opportunities. That's a kind of moving too. So I'm talking about priorities here. And if our priority is human community, connection, and love, moving is really the enemy of that if we're constantly on the road, because it means we cannot put our roots down. And this is really make, makes for unhappiness. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm advising people not telling them, hey, don't ever move again. If you need a job, you can't move. You're a bad person if you do this. I'm saying, look, look at the statistics on loneliness. And they are very much related to rootlessness. They're very much related to not bonding with people and communities and really investing yourself. They're related to this crazy idea that, you know, I'm always on to the next cool thing. And I'm going to go do that next cool thing and or earn more money. And I'm saying these are fake values and they will not serve you well as time goes by. You need to find out where you belong and be there and, and invest in that community. Um, eat, take, a, take a job where you earn less money. 
you know, marry the person you fall in love with or pair bond with them or live with them or whatever it may be, commit. Don't say, well, we can't work it all out. You know, he's going off here and I'm here. And, you know, it just never quite worked out. We couldn't get our career. So we sort of let it slide. You're going to wind up alone um, and you're going to wind up unhappy in one form or another. Even if you are dedicatedly someone who's staying single or celibate or whatever it may be, you still need some roots. You still need some community. And the way the United States is organized, putting business interests and corporate values first, it pushes people to move all the time for the money. Now, that's at the end where people can make choices. My book is also about the person who works three jobs, doesn't have any choices. And my book is passionately in favor of a level of social support uh, equivalent to Medicare for people my age, equivalent to social security for people my age. So there are no single moms chasing that third job just to make ends meet, to take care of their child. So when I talk about stay put, I'm also talking about build a culture in which people can stay put even in the lower economic order because we have a real uh, social safety net. That's also part of staying put is facilitate staying put. So it's not just a call to some airy fairy ideal that's fine for me because you know um, it's, I'm pushing 70 years old and I, I've been in the same house for a while. I'm also saying, look, for the people who are not as fortunate, for the people who are not part of the ruling class as a white male, you know, heterosexual I am in undeserved privileged positions, I'm saying let's level the playing field so that we have a social safety net so people can stay put near their families. So it's reorganize our values on one side away from this commercial academic status stuff. Second, when for those who are not given any good choices, let's give them some real choices and let's reorganize ourselves in terms of legislation and our economy and all the rest of it to really make room for these folks. Not talk about minimum wage anymore. Let's talk about the maximum wage a warehouse worker at Amazon can earn and not what we can get away with paying them and bust their unions. What, let's reorganize our society so we expect people to be properly taken care of. We expect people to be given childcare. We expect single moms to be given a stipend so they can live and not have this choice, either abortion or go broke, that we give them some real choices. So I also get into reorganizing our society around a social agenda, which is gonna make sense for more people so they can stay put. The the only thing I, I'd I'd add here is that there's a portion of staying put that's about the distance our minds or our brains mm -hmm. or our let's say our strategic thinking our industrial thinking has to travel mm -hmm. to our hearts that our our that kind of practical I got to get a job I got to do this thing I got to get I got to get on the bus I got I got to be yeah. home with this all that stuff there's often a big distance between it and our hearts mm. and I imagine and again as a person of significant privilege mm -hmm. um I say this advisedly and open to feedback that there's a way and I, I suppose I've heard this from lots of people who are significantly oppressed and significantly mm -hmm. underprivileged who say yet there is still a way through simple practices like meditation and breathing mm -hmm. to close the gap between the busyness and our hearts yeah. while those of us who are privileged have a responsibility for using our power to create mm -hmm. that kind of society in which um, what is typically called universal basic income, but I've I've read recently a better a better term for that and a more a likely more strategically effective mm -hmm. term in public policy would be citizen dividend. Um, that a citizen dividend of the kind that this this principle has already been accepted in Alaska. Every Alaskan resident can claim several thousand dollars a year in oil profits mm. um just just by being there and it's clearly socialism but it's happening in a, in a state that's not known for its left-leaning right right tendencies right. although speaking with someone who spent quite a quite a bit of time there last week said that it, it used to be the law it may still be the law but if you drive past a car that looks like it's broken down on the side of the road if you don't stop mm -hmm. to check on that person you're in violation of the law mm. And that your responsibility is to make sure they get to the next town, you know, um, and these are the things that we all know in our hearts mm. are the way we want things to be. And they already are in a lot of places. Mm. Um, they're not that far off if we put 
uh, are if we if we put our minds and action in the service of these common good oriented ideas and that, that's the only thing i would add is that yeah and i like of, that a lot and part of, part of it is developing is, your own spiritual yeah. practices that slow you down especially if you are a person who's required to or has a vocational call to yeah. be on the road some of the time as an act of service yeah I mean, and i I, I, think I do with with my life but it's not going to last forever and uh, you can yeah. see it around uh, the, the you can see it around the child care issue too going back to what i was saying and that is you know we don't keep moving for that job, but also create a society where mm -hmm. that single mom has some childcare mm -hmm. afforded her. And also let's be more sensible about smashing all our family connections. And it isn't, again, family can mean literal blood relatives, but it can also mean family in the sense of community. Don't just keep up stakes and walking away because, you know, and then wind up later in your life saying, I'm alone, I'm lonely, I don't know anybody here. Well, duh. Um, and that has nothing to do with remaining unpair bonded or unattached. That, that applies equally to people in bonded relationships and, and not. So I, it's a question of priorities. And I like the idea of this spiritual quality that you're bringing in where staying put also means being quieter, being centered. Like just staying put in your own body. Yeah, exactly. Many of us aren't have never. I would suggest many of us have never actually been in our own bodies. Mm -hmm. I think often of, uh, you know, like a Roadrunner cartoon in the time where Wiley Coyote gets hit on the head with an, yeah. with an anvil and he gets dizzy and then his or like he dies and his mm -hmm. spirit leaves his body. I feel like most of us, like our our personalities, our persona, yeah. are like only overlapping with yeah. our physical body and. Um, getting into your body is a tremendously liberating thing i'm not there which, yet speaking of which coming through the time of covid you find a lot of people who have been quote forced to stay put or work from yes. home and yes. actually now we're turning around saying we don't want to go back to the way things were we mm -hmm. want to stay home and be more with our children or more in our relationship or more with ourselves mm -hmm. in my own body with some quiet so i'm not just frantically sitting yeah. there commuting all day and so on so so, yeah, so the, co the COVID epidemic has given us a little bit of a breather to rethink some of this. And of course, that's part of the book as well. Just talking about, well, we were forced to do some of the things that I'm talking about. And obviously, a lot of people like the alternative because they are refusing to go back to the way things were. Well, funnily enough, given that we're talking about slowing down, hmm. We're, we're, we're looking like we're, we're, we're close to the end of our time. And we've got two more topics to discuss. So well, let's go so, through them quick. So save the planet. Uh, well, save the planet is a good means. one. It's what does the big, it mean in the context of this book? Yeah, it's the big one. And obviously what I'm talking about is a huge issue. Everything from global warming, climate change we saw in COVID, all of a sudden the skies were clear. But uh, in, the, in, in the context of my book, it comes down to the individual action of being invested in the community you're in, putting the relationships first ahead of career. Those big fancy careers that everybody lusts after also often coincide with the careers that are destroying the planet. And, you know, your, your, your mother breastfeeding a child, um, you know, is not, is not the problem here. Your, your, your gay husband and you working on your relationship in your coastal walk you're taking all the time are not the problem here. The problem is the greed and ambition of a culture which puts consuming and acquiring ahead of human relationships. Mm -hmm. And once again, it isn't that um, we solve everything by being more touchy-feely and kinder and better and gentler people, but, but the irony is, is that the, the fast-paced, ambitious uh, goals that our culture gives people when defining you by career also defines you by the amount of money you have and the amount of stuff you have and, the, and your ability to consume. And so making your life simple in some way and more people oriented and more spiritual in some way is actually good for the planet. Now it doesn't solve all our issues, but it does begin to change your priorities. And it also gives you an incentive to actually save the planet. You know, my incentive to save the planet is really straightforward. It's my community, it's my children. It's the same incentive I have for being more involved in my public school system here. It's, I've got skin in the game. I have kids, grandchildren who go there, but as a parent in the general sense we were talking about before, I've lived in one place long enough so I know everybody on my street. 
I know about their kids and grandchildren. And that includes the people who don't have any children. I know they live here. So the quality of our school system, the fact we built a library and we're a little community, but they didn't have much funds to do that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this is a kind of save the planet as well. And it's part of your, your emphasis on spirit being spiritually centered, on the meditation, on taking the time, on breathing deeper. It's, 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 it's really suppressing this weird sense of ambition we have always directed in the wrong direction that also coincides with what's most destructive to our environment. So we can't, you know, go into an enormous, you know, ecological kind of investigation here, but my book actually gets pretty specific in places about that. Um, but again, it relates to our idea of success and our idea of consumerism, which is all bound up in our idea of success. Mm -hmm. If we can't move on from this, we are going to destroy everything around us and have gone a good way towards doing that. So it fits very well with the rest of the agenda of the book because a natural result of putting people in your life ahead of stuff, things, prestige, power, money, greed, actually does a lot for the planet. That's, That's what it. I mean by it. That's it. And um, I, I, I think that the the process by which we talk about saving the planet, the, by which we talk about caring for the earth mm. is often so overwhelming yeah. that, you know, yes, there has to be massive change on, on a global level. Mm. Um, and every one of us gets to participate in this too. Yeah. So last of all, and this is why your book is going to be a runaway mega bestseller. I hope so. You're not, because you're not interested in success, um, <laughs> you're you're gonna sh you're gonna just s simply invite us all to your house for big parties that you. Why not? Maybe the pizza the oven will work out, and I can cook the pizza oven. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, be happy. Well, be happy. You know, in a way, I'd rather say be joyful. But mm. here's the difference between what my book is doing and a lot of books on, you know, on similar subjects. I am saying you are happy as a natural result. And please listen carefully, because this is different. I don't mean you, but anybody. One is happiest when one lives most in tune with who we actually are. In other words, mm. live in mm. tune with how we evolve to be. I'm not talking about doing the right thing because Jesus said so, or Muhammad gave this teaching, or Buddha said such and such. No, yes. I do talk about spiritual values, but that's not the point I'm making here. I'm saying be happy in the same sense as knowing your blood type if you wind up in the ER. Mm. And so instead of rejecting the transfusion, your body takes it and you live. Mm. In other words, get your butt in gear with who we actually are as human beings. And just here, the book goes into the science of this. Mm -hmm. If you want to be happy, I'm not talking about living a certain way according to the teachings of a prophet or this or that. I'm saying live in accordance with who we were actually made by evolution to be. Hint, it's to connect with others mm. and to love and to experience love and to give love. This isn't a sentimental idea. It's an evolutionary fact. Mm -hmm. It's a fact of brain chemistry. Mm -hmm. It is the way we evolve to be. It is the only reason there are families and friends and nations and cities and communities because we are caregiving sharers if we had not learned to share and to give and to care none of us would be here so when you get your life more in tune with this essential prime directives of evolution which is not the survival of the fittest but as i say in the book the survival of the friendliest you will be happier than you are if you were living banging your head against a wall because nature never gave you an instinct to be the president or CEO of a company, nature gave you an instinct to love and be loved and be cared for. And, and if you get your life in tune with that directive, you will be happier than if you don't. And so when I say be happy, it is a choice. It's a choice because if we define success in ways that make us unhappy because we're living in a false way, given who we evolved to be, we can fix that. So, you know, if you sign up for this porch course um, and talk to Gareth and me live as we teach this, 
we're going to explore this further. And I just want to add one more thing. And that is my book, Fall in Love, Have Children, Stay Put, Save the Planet, Be Happy, we've been talking about, comes out November 2nd. And if you have enjoyed um, any of my videos or my other writing or my conversation with Gareth here or speaking or anything else over the years, I would really appreciate you doing me a personal favor now, which is to pre-order the book on Amazon so that this book actually becomes something people pay attention to, because sadly, that's what it's about these days. Um, but it's also a good way to put it in small bookstores because they look at Amazon too, as do reviewers and other people. So that's just a personal request. And the other thing is, please sign up for this porch course with Gareth and me. We're going to get into some good things. We have some great guests and we're looking forward to having conversations with you about this. That's right. So, and, and, you know, people say stuff like this all the time. And I think lots of people are running online courses and they have great sincerity and integrity. And we want to join with anybody Hmm. who is seeking to promote the common good, learn to live better, right. ask questions and learn from each other. There is a registration fee, but no one is turned away on financial grounds. So if you can't afford the registration fee, just write to us through uh, uh, info at the porch and uh, we will we'll work to provide a partial or a full scholarship so that you can attend the course, whether or not you can afford it. Because of course, one of the things this book is challenging hmm. is the idea that we are valued based on how much money right. there is in the bank um, and people should have access to everything good. Um, yeah. And, and uh, as long as, as, as money is unjustly distributed, which isn't the same as unequally, but right. unjustly distributed in our society, it shouldn't be an obstacle to connecting with the best stuff. Um, I do want to ask you one question after I uh, just share one little anecdote about be happy. Mm. And the be happy anecdote is you're, you're, you're provoking me to think about in Field of Dreams when uh, Kevin Costner's character hangs out late at night with Burt Lancaster and he mm. hears Burt Lancaster's character, Doc Graham, has been a small town doctor for m most of his, well, actually all of his working yeah. life. And he's clearly someone deeply beloved in his community. But he shares this story that when he was 17, I think he had one chance to be at the plate at the end of the season when the scouts, the talent scouts were yes. there looking to see who they might put into Major League Baseball. And he was the last person called in the last game of the season. And he got to be up there for two or three minutes mm -hmm. and he didn't even get to hit the ball. And so he went to medical school instead of becoming a ball player. Now, with respect to all the professional baseball players who are listening to us right now, right. Um, you, you know if that was your calling. And if it was your calling, beautiful. Um, <clears throat> Kevin Costner's character, Ray Kinsella, says to, to Doc Graham after he hears he didn't get to be a ball player. He says, oh, my God, it's a tragedy. And Doc Graham says... It would have been a tragedy if I'd only gotten to be a doctor for 10 minutes. And that's what I hear you talking about, yeah. living in alignment with our evolutionary nature, mm -hmm. with how we're supposed to be in relationship with each other. Yeah. And, and you know, it, it, it may sound overly simplistic, but I really don't think it's any more complicated than from each according to their gifts to mm. each according to their needs mm. uh, that was a that was an idea about fairness and the functioning and the flow of society before mm. marx and engels said yeah. it uh if indeed it was them my gifts your needs your gifts my needs my propane gas tank yeah because my desire, pizza oven. <laughs> your desire for pizza um you only need one chainsaw. <laughs> That's it. Hey, speaking of which, by the way, uh, just to reiterate again, on this Porch course that Gareth and I are offering together, and Porch is is his magazine, the book is mine, um, no one will be turned away yeah. for lack of resources. So uh, please do not hesitate when you look at the, you know, the pricing of the course. If you need help or you want a scholarship or whatever, just let Gareth know when you write in. Absolutely. And there's, and that's just, just simply email. You don't need to, you don't need to defend your position. You just need to write to us and say, I need this and we trust you. And if you can contribute more to help us uh, share, help that more, person, that's sure. wonderful too. So here's my question. And it's, it's my last question, Frank. And that is, um, what if you're terrified? 
what if you're terrified and the notion of being happy seems so far off because there are literal actual objective sure. threats in yeah. your life and um that you, you know you you may be you you don't hold the kind of privileges that people like you and I have and i also think it that it it's 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 churlish yeah. to suggest that just because you're white or or cisgender sure. male or middle class that you don't face any threats or fears. Yeah, of clearly course. there are people in our society that uh are really at the front end of a yeah. sense of threat of a sense of 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 the walls closing in of perhaps real danger without wanting to overstate that yeah what if you're terrified well i you know terror is something i understand i mean I, I said an interesting thing to my oldest granddaughter, Amanda, the other day when we were driving back from Wild Goose. And this isn't really an answer to your question, but I'll just share it. I said, you know, getting older is actually something I welcome because I've spent so much of my life in fear mm -hmm. as someone who was trying to make their way as an unqualified freelance something or other, writer, artist, whatever, as someone who had a, has a temper and is always yeah. afraid of starting that fight that ends my marriage and had yeah. to work through that and learn how to handle it with the help of my wife, Jeannie. And I said, the great relief of pushing 70 is, is that most of my story is behind me now. And I sort of know how some of it turned out. Whereas when I was younger, the fear was always in the future. It's what could happen, what would happen. So that, um, you know, I, I'd say in dealing with fear, it's a place I've actually experienced over the years. Um, and looking back is easier than looking forward because the unknown is where the fears are. And all I would say about my book um, is this, and that is that it can help on the fear front in the sense that if we can align what we hope for most out of life with doable and achievable goals, mm -hmm. which if we're smart is not to be Jeff Bezos, if we're smart is to be someone loved passionately, who gives love passionately, whether that's in a romantic relationship or not. Sometimes our fears come from the fact that we have a set of priorities and goals mm. that are so out of line with who we most essentially are as a human being that they never seem achievable. Mm. So the fact of the matter is, um, you know, I, I think that if the book helps us realign some priorities that are doable on a scale that is doable, mm. it won't solve all our problems and all the fear goes away, but it puts it within reach. Mm -hmm. And most of my fears in the past came from ambitions that were that were uh, to do something or to feel safe or to be somebody that I wasn't. When when uh, we we reorganize our priorities and our definition of success to meet who we are at our deepest level in a way that is achievable in bite-sized pieces, uh, sometimes some of those fears can go away. That's all I would say. And there is no, there's not one answer to this, but it's it's something that is really important. Um, and and you know what? I know you to be a person who wants to sit in the ashes hmm. with people who feel, or maybe actually it's really true that all they have right. is ashes or all they right. can see is ashes. Right. You want to sit in the ashes with people and and with whatever resource and uh, you know that I, I want to step back from being you know it sounds like I'm blowing your trumpet so let's 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 not right. do that let's not um let's just say we want to be willing to be in solidarity with people and mm. far be it from us to define whether or evaluate our solidarityness. Right. Right. I don't know how much of an ally I am to women, how much of an ally I am to people of color, how much of an ally I am to indigenous people, how much of an ally I am to the GLTQ plus part of LGBTQ right. plus because right. I'm, I'm in the B part of LGBTQ mm. plus and I do think it's cre it is credible when people say only the person who's being offered sure. the allyship gets to evaluate are you being a good ally, ally yes. or not. I'm not. In, neither of us is interested in blowing our own trumpets about how much we are. Absolutely, we we are willing to be willing, and we 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 want to invite others who are willing to be willing to be with us on this journey. And if you're a person who needs allies and needs solidarity, we invite you to be with us too. And again, money. Money shouldn't get in the way of you participating with this. Just drop us a note and we'll we'll make yeah. sure you're able and to. And by the way, I just want to add one thing, and that is you did write this good, really great book that I quote in my book, 
How Not to Be Afraid uh, by Gareth Higgins. You, you can also read that as part of this project um, in terms of the porch course we're doing. We're doing the, the course on my book, but that book fits in with what we're talking about here. So, and, then, and at the end, we're going to have a celebrity mud wrestling contest. Yes, right. <laughs> over which book is better. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Anyway, um, Gareth, and, listen. And then, go, then go to the moon and the rocket that we've built. I'd be remiss not to just thank you for being here today on In Conversation with Frank Schaefer, talking about our upcoming porch course uh, that is going to go for five weeks uh, with five topics, which are the five headings of my book. Um, and we're going to explore that together with guests. And I do hope you sign up um, and I do hope you pre-order the book. Um, but the course will come before that book comes out. But on the other hand, um, uh, it'll be part of the project. You'll, you'll be getting the book as part of the course as well. Yeah, uh, so if you, if, you register, if you register at theporchcourses.com for this course, yeah. uh, you, you do get a free pre-release copy, uh, an a copy of, of the book. Um, hopefully, if you like it, you might, you might buy it later. Yes. And you'll also have the opportunity, everybody who registers at the, at the full registration cost gets uh, one free porch course to share with someone else. It can be the one that Frank and I are doing together or it can be yeah. one of our other courses yeah. too. Um, there are some other courses there as well. This course begins on the 26th of September. Um, again, if you're listening to this later on, it'll, it, it should be archived there and you can still register to participate. Uh, Good. You can find out. Well, sign up if you can. And uh, I look forward to seeing you out there, Gareth. And thanks. Thanks for taking the time. Hey, thank you, Frank. Love you. Love you too. See you. Take care. Bye. 